Okay, I got a question for everybody. I want a show of hands when you answer this question. Who in this room enjoys running and jogging? I see you lift them high, lift them high, lift them high, yeah, lift them high. If you like to run or jog for fun. All right, if you're sitting next to a person whose hand is lifted, I need you to pray for them right now in Jesus' name because there is something severely wrong with the wiring of their brains <laughs> that they enjoy running. I'm just kidding. I'm messing with you. But, you know, when I lived in Tampa, I actually went through about a three- or four-month period of time where I decided, you know what, I'm going to run in a mile and a half to two miles every night. I'm going to do it. Christina's like, hey, I'm going to do it with you. So I would run and come back, and then, you know, Ben's sleeping. We can't just leave our kid unattended in the house. And then he, she would run, and she would come back. And we would, like, take 45 minutes to an hour to recover. We're like... <sighs> this is going to pay off, it's going to pay off, it's going to pay off. And we continued to push through. Well, until we didn't push through. And we quit doing it. But since having Marshall, we do enjoy taking the stroller, putting some puffs in the front cup. Come on, parents, you know what I'm talking about. Them little puffs save life, come on. And then get Ben all up on his bike with his, his helmet on and taking little walks in the neighborhood. We enjoy walking in our neighborhood. It's a very quiet and very small neighborhood we enjoy walking through the neighborhood, and if you drive through a lot of neighborhoods in America, right after dinner time, you see a lot of people have taken up family walks before bed. I don't know if it's just an attempt to drain the remaining energy that's left in our body from a wild day, or if it's to drain our kids. Come on, somebody, because like when I put Ben in bed sometimes, he's still like, Brrr. I'm like, bro, you need to slow down. I'm like, slow down. So we go try to walk and ride bikes and take our time out on the neighborhood, meet neighbors, shake hands. And if you think about it, walking is kind of like, for most of us, is sort of just a natural thing we do, right? We just kind of walk, you know, walk around. I don't know, sometimes when I get bored, I like just get up and walk around my house and look for things to get into, look for things to fix or to whatever. You go to the store, you get up, you walk, you walk around the store, you just walk around. And if it's done intentionally, and if it's done consistently, we can actually walk in a way that will actually create a really good in, uh, outcome for us. You know, you got good form, you do it consistently, you're intentional about, hey, I'm gonna walk every single day, you put it on the calendar, and at the end of the day, you might like the results that you start seeing from walking intentionally and consistently, and that kind of sounds familiar this morning. The more consistent and intentional we walk, the healthier we become. That kind of sounds like mine and your Christian walk. The more, in, you know, intentionally and consistent we, we walk through this thing called a Christian walk, the Christian life, the outcome will be results that are pretty desirable. We get closer to God. We're slower to anger. We take on the fruits of the Spirit. We begin to look more and more like Jesus. The major difference is that our walk as Christians isn't quite as easy as me walking from here to there. It comes with a lot of trials, and if you're a new believer and you've not experienced those trials yet, oh, just wait, baby. Stay locked and loaded in your word. Spend time with the Lord because they're coming. And I don't say that to create fear. I say that to say, I told you so. It's going to come. It's going to happen. But if you were to take the stage lights and the room lights in this room and begin to slowly dim them, then walking across this platform gets a little bit sketchy. Trust me, I know. I come in here sometimes and I don't feel like turning the house lights on. I'm trying to look for a guitar pick or something. And I can't tell you how many times, thank the Lord by myself, I've stumbled and like fallen on the stage and been like, dang it, I should have just walked over there and hit the button and turned the lights on. But the darker it gets, the harder it is to walk. And the same rings true about our faith, our Christian walk with Jesus. The darker the world we live in gets, the harder it's going to be to continue to walk. Today, I had the pleasure of continuing the series we started last week, The Space Between thriving in the gap between now and the end. And this whole entire series is gonna be wrapped around two letters that Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica. And those letters are very, very, very important because they're gonna help us consistently and intentionally in our Christian walk become more and more healthy followers of Jesus Christ. So today's message is titled this, How to Walk in the Dark. How to walk in the dark. And most of you are thinking, well, what about a flashlight? I mean, just go to Lowe's, spend a dollar on a flashlight. It's an easy fix, right? But in our Christian walk, it's not quite an easy fix sometimes because you walk into dark places and about the only thing you have is faith in Jesus. 
But the only thing you're left with is faith in a God that sometimes you can't see, you can't touch, you can't even perceive. The series revolves around these letters, and the church at Thessalonica is trying to thrive in the space between their present and their also anticipated second coming of Christ, in which we still anticipate today, and we're still waiting in the 21st century. The Roman Empire in this time of Paul's writings in the church of Thessalonica had really grown really dark. The Roman Empire, if you read, has, had grown into a very dark society that had walked away from faith in God, had walked away from the things of any sort of deity or any sort of higher power, and they were just doing their thing at ground zero, ground level. But Paul is adamant about urging the local churches to stay focused and to stay locked in in their faith in Jesus. I love how these writings both applaud and alert the church at Thessalonica. It applauds the work they've done so far in which we'll see in just a moment, but it also alerts them, hey, adversity is coming. Adversity is imminent and it is coming. But here's the best part. He didn't just write a letter to a church 2,000 years ago that died with their church. He wrote a letter to you and I today. Don't you love that the Bible is applicable through the ages? Every time I read the Bible, those words just dive off the page and say, Mike, hey, 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 you can learn today. It may have been scripted 1,500 to 2,000 years ago, but hey, you can learn today. From what I'm trying to speak, the Holy Spirit's breathing through the word of God. And we can read these letters that Paul wrote and we can grow today. Are you curious as to how? Well, let's dive into 1 Thessalonians chapter four. I'm, I'm diving into some very interesting territory today in the fact that I've never preached out of this version of the Bible before. I'm an NLT all the way kind of guy. Anybody else read the NLT? <clears throat> it doesn't make you less than if you don't read the NLT. You just pick the version that God speaks to you the loudest and read it, right? I'm usually an NLT guy, but I was reading through the different translations of the passage for today, and the NASB, New American Standard Bible, is the one that spoke the loudest to me. There's going to be a little bit of language that's a little bit older, but we're going to take moments to slow down and talk through some of that language so we can all be on the same page. So are you guys ready? All right, here we go. Verse 1, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 1. Finally then, brothers and sisters, we request and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received instruction from us as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel even more. We're going to come back to this verse in a moment, but let's go to verse 2. For you know what the instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you would abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel or body in sanctification and honor. Not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God and that no one violate the rights and take advantage of his brother or sister in the matter. Because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you previously and solemnly warned you. Verse 7, for God has not called us for impurity, but in sanctification. Therefore, the one who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Gives his Holy Spirit to you. There's a lot to unpack here, and I want everybody to do me a favor. Take a deep breath. Here we go. All right, we're not talking about sex today. Everybody just chill, all right? Everybody just chill. Everybody's like, well, you probably shouldn't talk about sex in church anyways. Well, guess what? We do at this church because if, the, if our kids and our teenagers don't hear from us, where are they going to hear from? The high schools? The colleges? <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about that sometime, but not right now. Today, we're not diving into sex. We're diving into something a little bit deeper, a little more powerful. But before we dive into the full passage, like I said, we need to hop back to verse 1. Let's look at verse 1 again. It says, finally, then I, we request and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received instruction from us as to know you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel even more. We see four different words here that in a moment I want to break down. Request and urge, which is parakaleo in the Greek. To walk, which is peripateo in the Greek. To excel, which is parasio in the Greek. And then even more, which is malon in the Greek. There's four key words that we have to understand about this first verse in order for us to be set up to receive from the remaining six or seven passages. Here's what these words mean. Check it out. Request and urge. 
term of urgency to heavily suggest. To walk, peripateo, is make due use of the opportunity of our lives. To excel, perseo, to be great, to progress in excess. And even more, Malone, more willing, more readily, and more often. You might say, Mike, why are you reading definitions to me? It's because here's what it does. Words create a what? A sentence. And here's the sentence that Paul paraphrased. He said, we heavily suggest you make due use of the opportunity of your lives to be great. More willingly, more readily, and more often. How boring a life would be, how useless a life would be, how valueless a life would be if we were here to simply exist and not excel. How terrible of an opportunity with our life that we could fathom to just forget about if we don't choose to say, I will excel daily into the image of Christ and to walk in his ways. That is what Paul opens up this passage with. He says, hey, hey, church, I really suggest that you make due opportunity of your life. Be great more willingly, more readily, and more often. It's powerful. It's compelling to a church of a great time of hostility and darkness. It reminds me of a, of a speech one of my head coaches gave before I walked out of the locker room when I played high school football. He said, you've done the work. You've put in the time, and it's gone noticed. But baby, that rubber's about to meet that road, and it's not gonna be this easy forever. It's time to strap in, let's go. I'll never forget the Coach Dean Fabrizio in Deland, Florida, when I was in high school giving that speech. It's, it's imprinted in my mind and in my heart. I'll never forget it. And that's what Paul's saying to this church here. Come on, you've come a long way, you've done a great thing, but it's not over. It's time for us to strap in and let's go. Let's push forward. We gotta get better. We gotta move forward. So from here, Paul unpacks three different ways that I wanna share with you guys today that the church can walk in the dark in order to make due use of the opportunity of their lives. If we read a little bit further all the way into uh, verse three, we can learn how we can walk in the dark today. And his first commandment is this. We must walk in purpose. Walk in purpose. Verse one through C says, we, we request and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive instruction from us as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do, that you would excel even more. Verse two, for you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. I know you heard the sanctification word and it made you a little scared. You thought we were some sort of holiness church and if you're not wearing a skirt, the girls were all getting nervous, like I'm gonna get kicked out of here or whatever. That's not what I'm talking about. We're gonna get to that in just a moment. But I love how Paul explains this sequentially and intentionally. He says, we're gonna take a couple of steps here as to what walking in purpose looks like. The first step is this, a step for his pleasure. A step for his pleasure. Remember in, in, in verse one, it says that we have received instruction on how we should walk and please God. Not please ourselves. Man, do we struggle with that in America today. We don't want to do nothing that doesn't please us. We avoid the hard path because we're like, man, it's too hard to go down that road. I'm just going to take the easy way out. And I'm going to find pleasure in the easy way out. You see, the, the world's view of Christianity is that we don't understand happiness that comes from pleasure. They, they think that we sit in here as stiff religious people and the only happiness we have is coming to church one day a week and then we sit around and just judge all the sinners all week long. Monday through Saturday. Did you see what Sister Landa Dunn did on the Facebook? She was talking about the Sister Becky again. Oh my Lord. And maybe some of y'all do that. Maybe you need to be healed from that. But I'm telling you, that's not what this walk is about. We have access in this walk and news to you, world, this couldn't be more of a lie. We walk to aim to please God, and then we have access to something that is not temporary like what the world chases. We have access to joy. We have access to power. We have access to provision. We have access to freedom. We have access to healing. While the world is bound by their pleasures, we stand here with access to something greater than what the world could ever have. But sadly, many Christians, they just let the monetary and momentary treasures cost them their eternal pleasure in Christ. They sit back and they make Sunday a casual thing. 
But the greatest treasure in life is found when we please Jesus. When we remain in a place of saying, Lord, it's but my heart's cry to please you. No matter the cost, no matter the friendships that I have to give up to please you, no matter the drugs that I have to lay down to please you, no matter the addiction that I have to confront, I'd want to please you. And the world says you've reached pleasure based upon the, accl the, the, the acclamation and the, the, uh, the accumulation of treasure and things. But if we're gonna thrive in the space between today and when Christ comes back, we've got to understand that true, lasting, durable pleasure only comes in pleasure unto the Lord. Give our lives wholeheartedly to him. Paul even re reiterates this when he's writing to the church at Colossians. And he says this, that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. Live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that we may have great endurance and patience, giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. I know that's a different version on the screen, but let me tell you something. I don't think we're missing out on anything based on that verse. That if we choose to live a life worthy of the Lord and pleasing unto the Lord, we've got access to it all, baby. We can have the inheritance of heaven. We can connect with the resource of heaven. And we can be viewed in the sight of God as one of his many holy people. Is that what you're pursuing today? Is that what you're pursuing with the first step of saying, I'm here to please God? If we please God, we'll excel in every way. But then that takes us, the first step is to please God. But the second step, is a step for God's true purpose for our life. God's true purpose for our life. As a pastor, it's the number one question I get all the time. Man, what is God's will for my life? I'm struggling to find God's purpose for my life. Man, I don't even know why I'm created. Like, why, why am I here? But if we jump back and we looked at verse three, the answer is right there. Dedicating our lives to sanctification, it says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. Your sanctification. Sanctification's a big word. Like I said, it's a scary word in some churches because some people use sanctification to equate to works, but that's broken theology. Works flow from sanctification. They're not a part of sanctification. But if we break it up in the Bible, I'm gonna go through this quickly. There's three different forms of sanctification. There's the first one, which is positional sanctification, which is the sanctification that comes in Christ. It's a work of grace. Hebrews 10.10 10 says it this way. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So when we find a position upon salvation to say I'm in Christ, that means that we're sanctified by the grace of God in that moment. But then it doesn't stop there. It graduates to the second type of sanctification, which is progressive sanctification, which is found in progress. One's found in Christ. The next one's found in progress. It's a work of growth. Second Corinthians says it this way, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory after being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit of God. That means every single day we're working out sanctification progressively. We're progressing to be more and more in the likeness of Jesus, to look more and more like him as we grow in our faith with one another. For some of us, that sanctification by progression road looks a little bit different. That road had a lot of potholes in my journey, I'm gonna be honest, because I'd be doing really good going to church, Reading my Bible, I've been praying, I've been fasting, I've been weeping before the Lord. Then I stumble into addiction. <sighs> then I weep and I ask for repentance and I walk a little bit slower. Start reading my Bible, start getting in community, start building prayer life back up, worshiping when I'm not on the platform, which is really important, worshiping when it's not Sunday morning, which is even more important, spending time with the Lord, getting revelation of his word, but then I lose my temper on my spouse. So then I slow it down and I get back in my word and I stay there for a minute. Then I take another step and I pray. See, the progressive sanctification 
is a pace of grace that is measured by growth. We can't just be like, hey, we're sanctified by grace in this amazing one-shot positional sanctification. Boom, I'm good. I'm going to heaven, bro. Let's go party like a rock star. Let's go live our lives. That, that, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. There's got to be this handshake, this partnering between positional and progressive sanctification where we take step by step by step and let the Lord lead us and grow us. And then there's the last one, which some of the old saints will probably shout out, which is what we call perfect sanctification that is found in heaven. This is being taken up into glory, right? This is whenever you take the, this is back in the old day when they had the pews and people were shouting and throwing their wigs and jumping and running and throwing chairs. They're like, we're going to glory. Hey, glory, glory. He's coming on a cloud. Hallelujah. You know what I mean? That's the glory I'm talking about. That's perfect sanctification when the Lord looks at us and says, hey, Mike, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on, let's take on that perfect body. Let's go. Let's take on that perfect spirit. But that don't come quick. And it don't come free. It comes as a result of understanding and positioned with Christ, we have a grace. Progressively walking towards him and being more like him, we'll be found perfect in his sight in the moment of our calling to heaven. What does all this mean? Walking in purpose is a decision, it's a progression, and ultimately it's a destination. We've got to figure it out here on the earth with the grace of God. God's will for our life is to walk with a purpose. And it far exceeds a position, a passion, or even a place. A lot of people are like, I don't know if it's God's will for me to move and work transfer to you know, this geographical location. I don't know if it's God's will for me to take this job, this other promotion or whatever. I don't know if it's God's will. But if you realize that that's not really necessarily the primary focus of God's will. See, God's purpose for your life is not a position or a place. It's a posture. It's the posture of pursuit, continually pursuing out in prayer and calling out in prayer for the ultimate goal of being sanctified by the Lord and saying, God, wherever you send me, I'll go. Whatever door you open, I will take. Lord, my purpose is not built in what I do. My purpose is built in who I am, which is a son and a daughter of Jesus. And I choose to walk in your will and walk in your ways. And as I walk it out, you will work it out, Jesus. I know that you've got it put together. I just have to dedicate to progressive sanctification. That leads me closer to you. If you're a mechanic or you're a teacher or a doctor, a lawyer, a pastor, whatever, Paul's reminding us that our primary purpose is to dedicate our lives to the process of sanctification. And then if we do this, we receive wisdom, favor, and power that we need to do the works by which he's called us to. It's not as easy as just God's will is a thing. What this means is this right here. The works we do shouldn't drive our purpose. They should derive from it. The works of our hands should be the byproduct of the purpose that we found within God. And being sanctified daily into his image. So if you find yourself frustrated in your career path today, I ask you this. Have you let God's purpose guide your career or have you made your career your purpose? Because without God's direction, you're going to be a four and out at every organization you work for. Because you've not gotten close enough to God to say, Lord, I just want to please you first. I just want to look like you second. Now, practically, what does that look like? Do I need to continue this field of work? Do I need to continue in this relationship with this person who's not influencing me for the better? What do I need to do, Lord? Call me from this place. God is calling us to be people of purpose who live with purpose, in purpose, on purpose for his pleasure. And that's the beginning of passage one in 1 Thessalonians 4, which is a powerful reminder of our why. It's very important. But Paul makes a really unexpected turn in the next verse. Actually, within third, the third verse still, he makes a big left turn, like pretty quickly. And it seems kind of harsh, but it's actually very intentional. Because Paul knew that the church at Thessalonica needed the reminder that walking in the purpose of God and choosing to be sanctified in his image and pleasing him would help them overcome one of the most powerful influences of their region. So Paul tells them to first walk in purpose, but then he charges them to walk in purity. From purpose 
to purity. Purity is so important. Verse three through seven says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is that you abstain from sexual morality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel, which is his body, in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no one violate the rights and take advantage of his brother or sister in this matter. Because the Lord is the avenger of all these things, just as we told you previously and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in sanctification. God has not called us for impurity, but in sanctification. You see, the Roman Empire in this time period, which included places like Thessalonica, Ephesus, Galatia, Thessalonica, all these different places were within a Roman Empire. It had grown increasingly perverse and impure. The temptations were raging. Sexual and sensual lust were a societal norm. So living a life of purity in this community and in this region is definitely unpopular and viewed as even disrespectful at times that you wouldn't embark in this activity. But if we peel apart verse three through seven, we see what Paul, he dials in on two aspects of purity that are extremely important to you and I, that the church will need in order to walk in an increasingly dark society. The first one is this, being pure personally. Anonymous purity. Verse three, abstain from sexual morality for each of you know how to possess your own vessel. Possess his own vessel, body, in the sanctification and in honor. This is a charge that each one of us have a decision to protect our personal purity. And if we choose not to do that, we see that God is the great avenger. You know, one thing I've learned about when it comes to preserving personal purity is this. We're only as sick as our secret sin. We're only as sick in life as our secret sin is hidden. That's why it's so important for us to live a posture and a life like what James said in James 5. But your sins, keep them one to another. Pray for one another and then find healing. We have to choose to say, hey, I'm taking this thing out of the private and I'm placing it not in the public, but in a personal relationship with someone to help coach me and counsel me out of this lifestyle. But any sin kept unknown can become cancerous. And public exposure of that sin could be avoided if we were intentional about our progressive sanctification and personal purity in the first place. Our heart's cry should be found in seeking and being, and, and being right in the sight of the Lord because he sees it all and he knows it all. So what are we supposed to do? Speak up. Say something. Don't die of the cancer of impure sin in your life and not reach out for help. But it doesn't stop there. You have to find accountability. Find somebody who's not gonna be like, oh yeah, man, I'm gonna pray for you about that. Lord, I just pray for this person in Jesus' name. You wouldn't believe what James is dealing with. Don't look for that two-faced person. Look for the person who's got your best interest in mind, who will be a vault for you, and that will pray with you and walk you through it and get you the resources and point you back to the word of God every time you struggle and you have a hard time. But we find that accountability in the world we live in today is just merely not enough. I don't think God intended us to live in accountability our whole lives because there's a graduation step from accountability. It's called freedom. Friends, do you know that you can be actually free from sexual sin? You don't have to struggle with it the rest of your life, okay? You can be free from the addiction to alcohol. You can be free from the addiction to drugs. You don't have to struggle with it the rest of your life. But accountability can be the first step that leads you to full freedom. And then you know what you do at that point once you reach full freedom? You become accountable to somebody else who's struggling. And as they take a step, and they get accountable and they get free, what do they do? They become accountable to another person who's struggling. You see that? This is how the kingdom works. The kingdom is about reciprocity, making sure we're continually and exponentially growing one another in the sight of the Lord and sanctification so we get better. And taking the secret sins and saying, I'm not gonna let this cancer me any longer. I'm gonna speak up. I'm gonna speak out. And I'm gonna walk in the will of God, which is to be free and to walk in sanctification and look more like him. But the other aspect of purity is this, being pure in passion. Being pure in passion. He talks about it, having the right ambitions. We possess our own vessel, our body, in sanctification and honor. Not for lustful passions like the Gentiles who do not know God. 
He tells them not to chase after the lusts of the world like the Gentiles because they don't know God. They don't know God. And what he's saying here is, hey, there's a delineation. When you know God, when you know the Lord Jesus Christ, when you know his Holy Spirit and the power, don't chase after the things that you chose to lay down. Take on the things that he's calling you to and for. The warning here was that the lines can be easily blurred once we make that step of faith and get a little comfy. Man, hasn't it become blurred in the world that we live in today? Hasn't the line gotten a little bit blurry? You see, it's one thing to profess faith in him, and it's another thing to passionately follow him. The line has gotten blurry. We're creating professional Christians who are great at Sunday instead of passionate followers who are seeking him on Monday. Man, the line has gotten so blurred. We get passionate about the wrong stuff, church. We get passionate about whether or not the click track starts and all of a sudden there's an odd moment of silence and we're like, I failed today. Can I tell you something? The spirit of God moves even if the click track doesn't work. The spirit of God is still moving. We get passionate about the wrong stuff. We're like, oh man, I'm, I'm sanctified because I signed up for a small group. <laughs> Did you sign up for a small group? Yeah, but if the fruits of your life still show that you're living like hell, I don't care how many small groups you sign up for. You got to be sanctified. Small groups help us take those steps and to walk it out as God works it out. But if we choose to not live on the side of a passion of purity and be passionate about the right stuff, the enemy's going to yank us up by the throat and say, I got you. I got you, bro. You see, the first church, they had a sense of healthy personal pride about the mission they had been given. And it was evident. Paul even said it in verse one Hey, I see how hard you're working and you're walking like Jesus. They had a pride, like, man, yes, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I'm following. There's a pride there. Not like a pride that comes before the fall. You're allowed to have a little bit of pride every once in a while. Like, yeah, man, my team just won a game. That's the kind of pride they had. Like, yeah, we're doing great, man. We're doing good. But gradually, we've lost our edge, church. We've lost that healthy pride. And instead of walk, walking passionately and uprightly, we stumble around like a bunch of drunks who've been intoxicated by lust. Like, oh, yeah, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, but I'm just going to fall into this pit because grace. I'm going to go fall into this pit because grace, and grace is real. But it's also very much so like your checking account. Don't overdraw that thing because there's some fees attached to that thing. There's some fees. There's some costs you weren't expecting to accrue by taking grace not seriously in your life. We stumble around. Driven by a casual, shallow faith, all the while God sits in heaven and he says, oh, just a reminder, I'm coming back for a pure bride. I'm coming back for a pure bride. One that's personally and passionately pure about me and about their life. I love how Paul charges the church in 2 Corinthians. He says, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, or I, and I will receive you. How many Christians have become chameleons? <laughs> I'm, I'm guilty here, too. I'm not pointing fingers. Like, I, when I point one at you, I got five back at me, is what my son tells me. <laughs> right? How many times as Christians have we become chameleons and let the lines get real blurry and say, oh, you know, I'll just us. I'm ministering to this person that I'm living with but not married to. Come on, man. <laughs> I'm ministering to this young lady, you know, that just so happens to struggle with homosexual tendencies, and I'm another young lady, and we're just ministering to each other in our apartment, and we both struggle with the same sex attraction, but we're ministering to one another. Come on, man. Pure is pure. There's no blurry lines. It's a solid line. And Christ is calling us to come out from among the darkness to set ourselves apart and say, here I am, Lord. I will be the one that draws the line. I choose to draw the line starting with me. What if the church had as much passion about purity as the world has pride about impurity? It's June, baby. You know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> right? Everywhere you look in society, culture is trying to cram their pride for impure things down our throats. All the while, the church sits back, sips tea, and takes it. We've allowed the blurred lines to become the new normal. 
And we don't look so set apart at times. Scandals in churches across America make us look like hypocrites. That we sit back and we sip tea. But what if the church chose to stand and lay impurity down at the altar once again? And say, God, I just want to be found pure in your sight. I just want to be sanctified day in and day out. I'm not perfect. I'll receive perfection and glory. But right now, I'm a work in progress. And Lord, I need you to work on me. Show me the areas of my life that need work. What if we brought clarity to the blurred line instead of confusion? What if we were supportive about coming out from amongst them as the world is supportive about people coming out of the closet? And this isn't me pointing fingers, okay? I have a very close loved one who is homosexual, and it keeps me up at night because she used to be at the altar weeping for the Lord, but now she's not. So I'm not pointing fingers here. I'm letting you have a snapshot into my prayer closet as I, as I pray and I weep for this individual and say, God, turn her heart back to you, Father. Bring her back to your divine purpose. See, God is calling us back to being a church of pure values. College student, God is calling you back to purity. High school student, God is calling you back to purity. Middle school student, he's calling you back to purity. Parents, he's calling your homes to be a place of purity once again. Stop watching the junk on TV. Begin to raise your children in a way that you would aspire them to lead the society. Don't just throw a screen in front of them because they're inconvenient. Raise them in the way and the fear and the admonition that points to sanctification for the Lord's sake and pleasure and be pure. God's calling us back to purity. No more pastors falling in moral failure because they didn't protect personal purity. No more homes shattered by husbands and wives stumbling into lust. No more top grossing only fans and pornography accounts raging the market. No more teenage pregnancy statistics raging. No more sexual agendas being pushed on my kids. No more. No more. And it's okay, church, sometimes to get passionate and get a little frustrated. And to say, no more. I choose to draw the line because I'm done with it. I'm going to come out and be set apart in love, in grace, and in purity, pleasing the Father. But we can say no more. And how does this start? It's a simple question we ask the Lord. We say, Lord, what in my life doesn't please you? What is impure in your sight? Help me walk it out through the darkness. Help me walk it out through the darkness. The adversity is great, but the answer is greater. Let's feel the gravity of this verse again. God has not called us to impurity, but into sanctification. He's not called us to live below the standards of purity where we just blend in like a chameleon in our communities, but he has called us to be set apart and different for his glory and his pleasure on purpose and on mission. We must excel and be great while making due use of our life if our life be rooted in purpose and purity again, church. But I love the last step of our walk that he tells us to take. If we continue to read all the way down through verse eight, Paul says, walk in purpose, walk in purity, but then there's another level. Walk in presence. Walk in presence. The presence of God. Verse eight, therefore, the one who rejects this, what does this mean there? It means the instructions to stay pure and to not be passionate about the wrong things and to stumble into lust. For he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. When I read that verse eight, Paul has a great way of writing conclusionary statements in all of his writings. He's a very powerful writer. And I just read over it and I was like, well, that's cool. All right, I'm gonna go up to the counter and get another cup of coffee here at Lucky Goat where I was writing my message on Wednesday morning and everything's good. And I stood up and I just felt the spirit of God say, read it again, read it again. Therefore, the one who rejects this, it's not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. This is Paul's way of softly communicating this. When we as believers that carry his Holy Spirit walk out of our own pleasure and not his, walk in our own purpose and not his, and walk without purity, we're merely doing it in God's presence. 
right to his face. When you say yes to the call of God and you give your life to him, his presence, the Bible says, is within you. His spirit is within you. And there's another layer in Acts that you see called baptism of the Holy Spirit. Receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial physical evidence of speaking in tongues. Won't get into that today. But when you have the presence of the Lord in you, with you, and around you, when you act in what Paul said is this way, you're not doing it to hurt and harm a brother only. Because you're going to cause grief to yourself and other people when you act like this, right? When you walk out of impurity, out of purpose, in a bad way. But he said, no, 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 more so. You're doing it in the face of God by way and access of his Holy Spirit. Church, if that doesn't grieve us, I don't know what can. Forget the grief we cause others and ourselves by lavish, lofty, and lustful living. It doesn't pale in comparison of the grief that we cause the Holy Spirit because he's sitting there saying, son, daughter, I've destined you for so much more. There's so much more. Why are you settling? Why are you settling I'm not saying this to make you paranoid. I'm saying this to give you perspective. I'm not saying this to give you a complex. I'm sharing this to give you a commission. You see, it would be the plan of Satan that we would normalize a walk with God that's unaware of God's presence, where we blatantly lack purpose, walk in impurity outside of the pleasure of God. But what could happen? What could happen if we chose to walk this thing out in a way that no temptation could overtake us? What would happen if we chose to take a step and say, God, I want to walk in your purpose, even if it gets dark around me and I don't understand what my next step even looks like. God, I want to walk this thing out because I trust you. And God's got it and I can trust him. So I'm going to make those steps today. And I'm thinking through this today or yesterday as I'm studying and I'm reminded of a story in Exodus 33 of Moses and I close with this. Exodus 33, verse 13 through 15, God tells Moses, hey, I'm gonna lead, have you lead the Israelites in their discontentment, in their disobedience to what I believe is the trajectory towards the land of milk and honey, the promised land by which you've been striving to get to all along. But it's gonna be a dark walk. It's gonna be tough. Moses says to him, if you're pleased with me, then teach me your ways. Moses remained teachable. So that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. He said continue because he knew that it was a progressional sanctification he had to walk out. He wanted to please him. So he wanted to find favor with the Lord, which is the pleasure of God shining down upon him. He says, remember that this nation is your people. It's Moses saying, hey, we're your kids. Don't hurt us. Too bad, right? Then the Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And I love what Moses said in this last statement. If your presence does not go with us, don't even send us up from here. Moses knew the value of walking in purpose. Moses knew the value of walking in purity because it showed in his humility. And he wanted to please the Lord because he says, I just want to find favor with you, God. But he also knew that he was a train wreck without the presence of God. And that his walk in the dark would be directionless without the presence of God. With that, what should we do? We come out from amongst the world. We dedicate ourselves to being set apart and different. We walk in a way that looks more and more like Jesus. And last but not least, we make up our minds just like Moses did, that we're not gonna do it without God's presence. And that we're gonna be aware that in the darkest moment of our walk, he is right there with us, around us, and working through us. We choose purity even if it lacks popularity, knowing that pleasing God in his presence and in his purpose that as we walk it out, he will work it out in us and through us, step by step, and we walk to bring him pleasure. I, I don't know how this resonates with you today. I know it's a heavy word. I'm typically the guy that tells a bunch of jokes and leaves everybody giggling. But I could not share that with you because I believe that the time draws near to where a great divide will come here on the earth before we are called up to heaven. And in that great divide, I don't wanna see people that I love fall into the chasm 
because they didn't choose to come out from among them. Step into the pleasure and the purpose of God. Live a life of purity and say, God, wherever your presence shall lead, I will follow. And I don't know where you are in that journey today, but I believe that God sent you here specifically to receive that word today. That God is working something deep inside of you. Hey, how incredible was that message today? I don't know about you guys, but I know for me that my life has been changed. If you haven't done so already, take a moment, go down below and click subscribe. This is a good way to stay up to date with all the content that we're putting out, like messages that you just listened to. You can also like this video, comment down below, or even share this. Who knows, your obedience to share this video could be someone else's miracle. If you're looking for more information about Transformation Church, you can go to our website www.transformtlh.com. This is going to give you info like service times and all that great stuff. We hope to see you though in person one of these Sundays. Come and say hi. We'll see you soon.